This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 19. On last week's show, we were shooting things down, but this week, we're blowing stuff up. Yeah, baby! Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is Vincent Aiello, and you have found episode 19, the end of a three-part series that started with Mongo's MIG kill and last week, the air-to-air weapons. This week, we'll wrap it up with Colin Price. We're talking air-to-surface weapons. It's going to be a great discussion. It's coming up in just a few minutes. As always, just a couple quick announcements and some listener questions before we get to the interview. Well, I hope everybody's doing well. I'm still having a good time with this podcast. It looks like you all are too. Appreciate all the support and feedback I have received. And as I mentioned last week, we are plugging forward with improving our YouTube channel. Our listener, Bobby, is helping with that. As well, we've got Yannick down in Australia rolling out our new website soon. So take a look for that. As well, we've been active on the other social media platforms and even our newsletter. So if you're not signed up for that, go to the website and check it out. A couple days ago, I sent out an email or a newsletter. Usually, I send them out about more air combat related topics, but this time, I just sent a note out saying, hey, you know, if you've got something you've been thinking about doing, do it, because you'll be surprised at the response, and I was referencing my own journey launching this podcast. I've just been overwhelmed and excited at the response I received, and I thank you all for that. All right, my pro tip for the week is if you have a home you're going to vacation rent for one summer month, don't rent it to three 21-year-old males who call themselves, quote-unquote, entrepreneurs. <sighs> yeah, well, enough about that. You don't want to hear my problems. Anyway, otherwise, life is good in the Aiello house. We are having a good time and enjoying summer, and I hope you are as well. All right, let's jump right into then the listener questions. I don't have any phone calls this week, so if you want to jump to the head of the line, send in a phone call because I always enjoy playing those for everybody. Another way you can do that, though, is on our Patreon site. If you sign up at the $5 per month or higher level, you get your questions read first. And in fact, Vico is one of those patrons. Thank you very much. And he writes, in a few episodes, you guys have mentioned pilots being fired. What happens to them next? Do they have a chance to find a new job in the Navy or just another squadron that takes them, etc.? Well, thanks for the question, Vico. My experience is only with the Navy, so I'll answer from that point of view. And you have a whole spectrum. On the one hand, you might just get your hand slapped if you do something dumb and get sent right back to your squadron. On the other hand, you could get sent to another squadron. I believe we talked about that on a previous episode, and that friend of mine went on to do well. In fact, he commanded his own squadron after that was all said and done. And then there are cases where you might be essentially fired from flying, but the Navy still uses you in some other capacity, maybe as an intelligence officer or supply officer or something along those lines. And then depending on the offense, if it's egregious enough, of course, they might just send you out the door and off you go into civilian world. All right, next from Rob, also a Patreon subscriber or patron, I guess I should say. He's from Iowa. You've heard of him before. Rob asks, what's the inside scoop on the filming of Top Gun 2? Well, Rob, your timing is perfect. Just the other day, they were filming another motorcycle scene, like where Tom Cruise rides next to the F-14 in the first one. And they were filming it out here at North Island, just where I live. And the F-18 they used, since all the F-14s are gone, was piloted by, guess who? Episode 3, Vern Vernalis in the front seat, and Episode 1, Sunshine in the back seat. So... Look for that when the movie comes out next year. As I understand, they're now up in Lemoore doing some filming. A friend of mine, the Tailhook executive director, is the military liaison to the film. And I have no idea what it's about. I have no idea how good or bad it will be. I don't think anyone does till it comes out, of course. I'm a little nervous, I'll be honest, but I look forward to it. I wish I could have grabbed Tom Cruise or someone else uh, while they were in town here and gotten them on the show, but you know, I just not quite that big yet. With all your help, maybe we can get there soon. 
All right. Next question is from Stephen in the UK. He says, a question on color schemes. The U.S. Navy in the past has had the best looking aircraft in history with fantastic squadron paint schemes on aircraft like the F-4 Phantom, McDonnell, F-3H Demon, A-4 Skyhawk, and the list goes on and on. My question is, does high-vis paint scheme make that much of a difference in spotting an aircraft quicker than a low-vis boring gray scheme like the F-18 has now? Or do you think this is to protect the identity of the squadron and pilot from publicity in times of conflict like now? You know, Stephen, I did a little research on this, and I could not find any authoritative information on why we changed from the somewhat brighter paint schemes of the Vietnam era with the glossier grays and whites to what we have now. And my guess is that someone along the way realized that those higher gloss paint schemes reflect the sun better, which is one way to gain a tally right away if you get a sun glint off the canopy, or in this case, the paint job. It might have had something to do with corrosion as well, but I don't know for sure. But my guess is that someone just realized, hey, if we do a dull gray paint like primer on a car, it tends to absorb the sun. It blends in with the sky a lot of times if it's overcast, and it just makes it easier or I should say, it just makes it more difficult to be observed by the other aircraft that might be looking for you. So does it matter? In my personal experience, I never felt that high paint scheme, color, gloss, I don't know what to call it, uh, added to my long range tallies. But within the visual arena, within a mile or two, it helped to discern between aircraft. So if there was one, and the squadrons still do this, they'll have one or two with fancy paint colors. I think anyone who's Googled jet, you know, pictures has, has seen this. They'll have one or two, they call them the CAG birds that have bright colors. And I don't really think it matters. In the visual arena, if I was being jumped by two and one of them happened to be the CAG bird, it just helped me to know which one was which because otherwise they all look the same. They might have a different side number, but otherwise it was impossible to tell. So I didn't find the tactical significance of it was very much a detriment to having one aircraft that was a little bit you know, more done up. But I would say the previous paint scheme probably did reflect the sun a little more and they found that that was not ideal. All right, next up is Jason from Summit, New Jersey. Jason asks, I understand the very basics of Bernoulli's principle that air rushing over an airfoil creates lower pressure on the top, resulting in lift. How do planes fly inverted then? The most common answers I've gotten have something to do with either momentum or manipulating the wing. Well, Jason, as I understand it, an airfoil is still an airfoil, regardless of our perspective of it, whether it's upright or inverted. And as long as you have an airfoil, which is designed in such a way that even with a little positive angle of attack while inverted, the air that rushes over the top is still going to be faster than the air going over the bottom, which is actually the top of the wing. Hope that didn't confuse you. But when it's inverted, the top of the wing is down. And so you're still going to have lift created by that wing because of the same principles that are in play when the wing is upright. Now, to be sure, most wings are not formed to fly inverted. And so you do have leading edge and trailing edge flap surfaces on a aircraft like an F-18 with the fly-by-wire flight controls that could affect the camber or the shape of the wing a little bit. But you also have, don't forget, the empennage or the tail of the aircraft. And that always has a little opposing force to keep everything in balance. So when you're inverted, there might just be less of that force just to aid in the aircraft still creating lift. You might have also noticed that when aircraft fly inverted at air shows, they often do it with a little bit of a parabolic arc. In other words, they start up just a little bit and then they roll inverted and then they slowly come back down. And by the time they get to level flight, they usually roll out of it again. And that's just because even though they are still creating lift, they just can't create enough with the wing upside down like that. So that's a great question. And truthfully, I had not thought of it until you asked. So I appreciate the question, Jason. All right, one more quick one from Richard in Boston. He asks, does the U.S. Navy participate in the red flag training exercise? I don't know if this was basically the U.S. Air Force version of Top Gun. So Richard, you have two questions there, really. Yes, the Navy does participate in red flag, although I never personally did, but I know the EA... 6B Prowler used to quite often, and now the EA-18 Growler does because the Air Force lacks a little bit of the electronic attack capability that the Navy has. 
And also, I've heard of squadrons going there to act as adversaries or red air or opposition forces. Now, to your second point, though, no, Red Flag is not the Air Force version of Top Gun. They have their own weapon schools, and those are a little different than Top Gun. They're quite a bit longer. I'm hoping to have a show in the future on that. But Red Flag is a large force exercise, and Top Gun and the Air Force's version are more specialized individual training to create doctorate level tacticians in air combat. All right, great questions. Thanks for submitting them. And again, someone phone a message in next time so that we can uh, play one of those for you. I'm not sure why I enjoy doing it, but I just do. All right, as promised, here is our discussion on air to surface munitions. All right, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we're going to talk stuff that blows up. Here to help me do that is, are you a commander now, by the way? I am a commander Okay, now. so here to do that with us is Commander Colin Price, call sign Farva, our second Farva on the show. Dude, welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jell. Long yeah. time no see. I know, it's been a while, so I'm glad you're in town. He's getting himself ready, as he'll say here in a moment, to be an executive officer of a fighter squadron, so that'll be cool. Strike fighter squadron. Strike fighter squadron. Yeah, you betcha. Yeah. All right, Gotta so, be specific on that. That's right. So on that note, uh, we always start, as you know, you've listened to a couple episodes, you said. We always start with a little background so the listener can get to know you. Uh, give us the quick 411 on who Colin Price is. Yeah, so I uh, grew up in a uh, Air Force family. Both my dad and my stepdad were both air traffic controllers. So I grew up hanging out in a uh, tower and uh, approach control watching uh, F-111s taking off. So as a six-year-old, you can't kind of see that and not think that that's the coolest thing you could do in your life. So grew up wanting to be a fighter pilot, ended up uh, trying to go to the Air Force Academy. They said no, so I went to the Naval Academy to give myself some options. They told me I couldn't be a pilot, so then I tried to ask the Air Force to let me be a pilot. They said no again, but then I... Uh, <laughs> Kind of lucked into getting myself into a Navy pilot spot and then uh, kind of continued on my way. I did my uh, first J.O. tour in Lemoore. Did some time flying with the Air Force, actually, in the uh, back of a U-28. So I got some uh, Wizzo appreciation working a sensor and not flying. What is a U-28? U-28 is a uh, modified Pilatus PC-12 oh, okay. that's flown by uh, AFSOC, and they uh, support special operations. So I was yep. out in Afghanistan. AFSOC, Air Force Special Operations, operations Command. Command. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what did you fly in Lemoore? Sorry. Uh, I was uh, started out F-18E, so okay. a single-seat guy. Yep, all right. Uh, and then after that, uh, after my stint in Afghanistan, went to Fallon, did some uh, instructing there, and then I uh, got picked up for department head and went out to uh, VFA-102 in Japan. Uh, and then I loved Fallon so much, I went back to instruct, and that's where we uh, crossed paths as that's I right. took over the F-16 program manager from you, did some stint as uh, air wing training, uh, training guys getting ready to go on deployment, and then I uh, got picked up to be the uh, – Right now, I'm the prospective executive officer for VFA-154, which is another two-seat squadron in uh, Lemoore, California. Outstanding. In fact, the other Farva who was on the show was a prospective executive officer, so it seems to be a phase of you guys going through. I wonder if Super Troopers came out about it. We probably got to the fleet <laughs> at the exact same time, I could, I could almost guarantee. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. And uh, let's see, what else was I about to ask you? Oh, so when were you in Japan? Because I left there in 10, so I bet we just missed each other. You did. I, well, I showed up in uh, February 2012 okay. and left in uh, October 14th. Right. So, yeah, you'd been in Fallon, I think, for a while. Yeah. When well, I after, after yeah. Japan, I went to Third Fleet here in San Diego. Yeah, did my go. one and only non-flying tour, so yeah. good appreciation. All right. Excellent. So today, like I talked about, we are talking air to ground, what they used to call now air to ground. I guess now we call it air to surface because the surface can be more than just what? Could be air? the water as well. So okay. We, we got weapons that uh, or targets that can be destroyed on the water, so all it right. must be uh, all inclusive, include them as well. Okay. So air to surface weapons. All right. Now let's have a scenario maybe for this discussion today, and we can go to it and come back from it depending on how good of a scenario it is. But when you get to your squadron someday, it's possible the air wing commander is going to come up to you and say, Farva, I need you to blow up this target. So probably most listeners don't really think too much about the details that go into that. I, they might just think you put a bomb on an airplane, you go over the target, you push the button, the bomb blows up the target. End of story, everybody celebrates. At least that's how it is in the movies, yeah. That's right, yeah. Well, nobody, we've talked about that on this show. Nobody wants all the gory details behind the scenes. But there's a little bit more to it. Can you walk us through what you would do if you were tasked to blow something up? And let's just call it, uh, what do you want to call it, a tank, maybe? 
Yeah, Tank's probably uh, an easy run-of-the-mill target okay. to talk about in a scenario, not necessarily blow up. All right. Uh, so the first thing you're going to probably do is find your uh, target tier. Uh, we usually we have one or two of those guys on staff that are attached to the air wing, not to the squadron, but... Uh, and those guys are specialized intel officers that have been trained and deciding, hey, what is going to be the best weapon to blow up a target? So uh, this is someone who's not a pilot, but that's their specialty? That is their specialty. Okay. Like I said, they're the intel guys, and they usually have a couple people working for them. And they do two things. Really, the big thing that we want them to do uh, is give us the best possible target coordinates. So they're going to you know, use satellite imagery or whatever they need to in their special systems to give us the most exact, precise coordinate. Because if I have an exact coordinate, that makes my job easier to find the target and put the bomb in the right place. Uh, and that's kind of that aim small, miss small kind of mentality. So if I can minimize the miss distance, my bomb's going to have more effect against the target. So already my analogy is failing because a tank, as you well know, can move 100 meters left or right in no time at all. Exactly, right? So that would be one where that's going to change kind of our mentality. But maybe sure. the least they have the latest uh, location where we think it is. Uh, and that kind of minimizes the where I have to go look sure. for said target. Or fixed structures. I mean, buildings, radar facilities, all kinds of different things that don't move. Exactly. Okay. Easy enough. And then after that, they're going to use a, uh, a program that we call uh, JMEMS, or Joint Munitions Effectiveness Manual. And uh, this is kind of the gonculator, if you will. It's a computer program that they plug in, like, hey, this is the target I have. Here's the size. Here's what it's made out of. And it has a pretty extensive list of kind of really every target you can think of. And they'll plug that in and then uh, kind of put in maybe some parameters, what altitude we might be at, what kind of weapons they think might be the best to do it. And then that's going to calculate what the effective weapon is going to be and what we call piece of D or probability of destruction. And we'll kind of use a 0 to 1.0 scale. And most of the time we say, hey, we want to destroy something at a 0.7 probability of destruction that if I go out 10 times, probably 7 out of those 10, I'm going to successfully destroy this target. And then that targeteer will come back and he'll give you a list of weapons. And he's like, hey, based on what I got in JMEMS, here are the best weapon for you to use. But he'll give you kind of a couple choices because weather can be a factor. Does the target move? How hard is it going to be to find? Those are all the things that could make me want to use one weapon uh, over another weapon. Now, as a, as a pilot or air crew, we certainly can go into JMEMS ourselves. And, and a lot of times we'll do that as well just to kind of check on our own to give us kind of the warm fuzzy. But we, we do have a specialized guy to do that. Uh, Will he also us. consider what's aboard the ship? Uh, let's assume we're on a carrier for this scenario. Or is that up to you at that point to talk to your squadron gunner? Yeah, so we, we, we'll, we'll kind of know what's going to be on the uh, aircraft carrier, which should really be most of the weapons that, I, that I can employ can on an right? F-18. There's a couple of exceptions. Uh, rockets would be the, uh, the big one. But maybe we only have a certain limited number of those weapons that we want to save for a higher priority target. And that, that could be a consideration as well. And that's something I'd go up to maybe CAG and be like, hey, how important is this tank or building? You know, we've only got a couple of these weapons left. And the worst case, you know, we call up the supply people and they pull up a ship right next to the carrier and then unload a bunch of weapons for us as well. That's right. Yeah, but we that, just talked that, about that. Yeah, but of course, that's going to extend the uh, the time. So. Uh, yeah, maybe, hey, if I don't have to hit this target for two weeks, maybe that's something I'm going to ask for, but probably not likely. Okay. So you talked about the different P sub D and the probability of destruction, but we also have different kinds of kills we can affect. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So just destroying a tank may be what we want to do. We just want to turn that thing into a bunch of uh, tiny little pieces of scrap metal, but maybe we just want it to prevent it from being able to fire on someone, or we want to prevent it to from moving so that maybe a fall-on wave can do uh, more destruction. So we kind of call, we use different kills. Uh, so we have what we call a K-kill. So that'd be the catastrophic kill or like, hey, this thing is no longer ever going to be functional Basically, ever again. Basically, total destruction. Total destruction okay. or annihilation. Uh, M-kill would be a mobility kill. So, hey, I knock off a track or something like that. Uh, and then a, a F-kill would be a firepower kill. And i.e. he can't use his uh, his turret anymore and he can't shoot at us as well. And that's going to change, you know, for me to get a 0.7 piece of D for a catastrophic kill is going to require probably more weapons against a tank than, hey, if I just want to do a firepower kill at a 0.7. And sure. that's something we could take into consideration. Not only more weapons, but maybe different types of weapons, right? Because now when you talk about a radar system, depending on what we want to do to it, it might dictate that we use maybe a cluster munition if we want to just keep it from radiating or 
something a little bigger if we want to, no kidding, get a KKL on it. Right on. Okay. Yep. All right. So with that segue, we've got a couple different considerations on targets. Uh, one is if something is blast versus frag sensitive. In other words, we have something that we want to hit, and it may be more susceptible to the shockwave of an explosion or the little bits of flaming metal that are coming out of an explosion. So let's talk about that a little bit and how does that affect what you do? Yeah, so precisely. So a, a blast, uh, you know, we can use the extreme, right? Like a nuclear weapon, a lot of the damage it does is the shockwave that it sends out. We on the F-18s don't carry nuclear weapons, so we're not going to go to that extreme. But our larger weapons are going to provide more of a blast effect, and that might be better against you know a building or something to that effect. Probably not against a tank. You know, tank I probably have to put you know more pieces of shrapnel in it to cause that damage. And our smaller bombs are going to have more of a a frag type uh, effect against something. But again, like a 2,000-pound bomb is going to have plenty of frag that's going to do damage as well. Sure. But it does a lot of damage purely just from uh, its blast effects. So if we're going after a reinforced target, maybe it's a building with a bunch of concrete. If we ping a bunch of metal off the side of it, it's not going to help that much. But if we can knock it over with a blast wave, that'll help. And then we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about another method on that particular target. But now if you've got people, frankly, troops, uh, you've got radar equipment, aviation you know, any of those are going to be soft very metals, susceptible. Yeah, kind of soft targets. Right. The, the uh, lightly, is going to be the way Lightly armored vehicles, you yeah. betcha. So any high-speed traveling shards of metal are going to do some damage to that. All right. So back to my building example, what, do, what options do we have against something with maybe some reinforced concrete or maybe it's even buried in the ground? Uh, so the big thing is going to be uh, penetration effect. So the, how far we can get the bomb to go into the ground uh, prior to it exploding. So we have the ability to actually airburst the weapon so I can have it blow up you know, several feet above the ground to spread that frag out, kind of maybe cover a little bit more distance. I can have it blow up as soon as it hits the ground. So again, it's kind of spreading that frag. Uh, but if something is buried into the ground or a building, hey, I don't want it to explode on the roof. I want it to explode inside the room. Then I want to put some sort of delay fuse Uh, on the bomb and that will as soon as it senses impact it will delay the triggering of the bomb uh, for a set amount of time something i would figure out using and my targeteer would figure out using uh, jmems and so that way it goes through the roof it goes for its set delay and then it blows up inside that room and then now it's all those blast effects are going in the room and that's probably what's going to destroy the building that's pretty gnarly and don't we have some fuses these days that i don't know how this works but it i guess maybe it senses the resistance between floors and so it can actually count the number of floors it's going down or something. yeah so yeah if i wanted to hit the uh, you know the second floor of a fifth five-story building i could probably uh program that and that's the air force has that fuse uh, we in the navy have not gotten the privilege of using that f- fuse so we actually have to do the kind of physics math of if i'm traveling at uh, you know this velocity that this is probably how far i'm going to travel in this distance to blow up right uh, plus the impact angle all that kind okay. of stuff yeah so there there is some nerdery uh, physics that's involved <laughs> with, with figuring out how can i best maximize my effects for this particular bomb or weapon excellent all right and then you talked about the air burst i mean I guess you could make an argument that if it goes off in the air, that's not great as far as it's above the target. But again, if we've got aircraft behind revetments, whereas if the bomb goes off on the surface, the revetment may protect it. Now we can have that target being hit because it's going off. Yeah, because all the the frag would be prevented from that bunker or that Mm -hmm. kind of revetment that's covering the uh, the aircraft. But now if I put it over, you know, it's raining the shower from above, you know. Uh, as well, yeah, sure. and with the uh, we'll talk about it a little bit, but with us not really been able to use cluster munitions as well, which were perfect. Uh, unfortunately, against those kind of troops in the open example, we can kind of make a poor man's version of using an airburst weapon mm-hmm. that now is going to spread that frag over a longer distance and have more effect against troops in the open or other kind of soft sure. targets. Are cluster munitions pretty much out now? Yeah, with the ones that we have in our current inventory, there was a, uh, a moratorium put that, hey, all these cluster munitions don't explode. So unfortunately, what that's leaving is a small, you know, soccer ball sized uh, object for a kid to find, you know, six months, two years from now. So the entire world got together and said, hey, unless yeah. it meets these strict requirements, we can't have cluster munitions. So the ones that we have in our inventory, we're phasing out to not use those anymore to meet that 
uh, moratorium. I guess it's a real problem in some countries. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I can do some research later, maybe put it in the show notes. But apparently it's a real issue in certain places that have seen a lot of war. I, you said you were in Afghanistan. I used to jog a perimeter at Bagram, and there yep. was areas that were roped off, like, don't go in here. because yeah, there's, there's, there's still the mines left from yeah, the, the Russians. Mines uh, and there. all kinds of unexploded ordnance, and presumably some of those. Yeah. All right. So I guarantee you Afghanistan is probably high on that list oh, of yeah. unexploded uh, munitions. Yep, for sure. All right, so let's see. I think we've done most of the preparation before we figure out what weapon we want. And, of course, we've got to plan the rest of the mission, and we'll talk about that on follow-on episodes. But at some point, you come up with a weapon that you want. You know how you want to deliver it, whether it's an air burst or just regular detonation on contact or penetration. And then you've got the weapon to target match that we talked about, and that will drive the different types of bombs that we're going to spend the rest of our discussion on. All right, so let's start off with your bread and butter, general purpose, free falling bombs. And again, this is where you fly over the target. Of course, you've got a calculation that in the old days you had to do with your own eyeball in a fixed sight, but these days the computer does it for you. And you push the button and the weapon just falls ballistically. What do we have right now in the F-18 inventory that is in that category? So our main bombs, and uh, these are kind of really the bread and butter for everything we do, is going to be our Mark 80 series. So... A uh, Mark 82 is a 500-pound bomb. A Mark 83 is a 1,000-pound bomb. And a Mark 84 is a 2,000-pound bomb. And usually you can take that kind of weight and cut that in half, and about half of that's going to be explosive. So, again, uh, Mark 84, 2,000-pound bombs, probably going to have just under 1,000 pounds of explosive. What's the rest it. of it? Uh, that's just going to be the encasing, uh, all the lug nuts that we are able to hang it, and then the, uh, the fins that we put on it uh, as well. Okay, so you've got this chocolate Easter egg for an awful example, but you've got the shell and then you got the chewy center and that center, as you're saying about in a it, market, it's, it's all explosive. It's explosive. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then on this outer shell, we've got some thermal protection, right? To keep it safe in case it gets enveloped. Yeah. The a ones fire. that we prefer to carry uh, on the aircraft right. carrier. Okay. Yep. And then you slap a set of fins on the back, maybe a fuse in the nose or maybe in the tail or both. And then you go out and you could drop this thing. Now, what kinds of fins do we have for something like this? So we can uh, drop that bomb in a uh, free fall. So it's going to be low drag. So it's just going to, you know, go use gravity to uh, get to the target a little quicker. Then we can also kind of put what most people probably heard of as like snake eye fins, where the fins, as we drop them off, they pop out, create drag. And now the bomb is uh, being slowed down. And that means I can get away from it a little sooner, which means I can drop it at a lower altitude. And I don't have to worry about the frag from that bomb impacting my aircraft, which would be a, a bad day. We also have ones which would use balutes. Uh, which is a parachute that pops out and does the uh, the same effect. So a uh, great thing about the F-18 is uh, we've got a bunch of cables that come out of those bombs that are attached to the fins or the fuses uh, and then attached to the actual aircraft. And then based on what I'm put in my system, uh, I can in the cockpit kind of decide, hey, I want to drop this thing in a free fall mode or I can drop it into drag mode depending on right then and there what I decide is probably the best way to attack a particular target. So that gives us as an air crew a lot of flexibility uh, as we get out there, especially in a close air support kind of uh, mission, supporting those guys in in different ways. For sure, because if something changed and for whatever reason you have to drop from high altitude now, you don't want those fins to open and have a high drag because that just throws everything off. Yeah, you know, dropping is something because that changes the circular error probability, you know, how close that bomb is going to hit the target. Right. If I'm dropping that from 20,000 feet in a, in a high drag, circular error probability goes through the roof, and so I'm not really going to be all that accurate either unfortunately what happens though is sometimes guys hit the wrong button and they mean to hit hit something in uh, low drag or high drag and then they do the opposite and they end up (laughs) dropping a bomb off a range Uh, it's what we call pilot error yeah i had a uh, unfortunately i had a buddy uh, as a jo who uh, had the the call sign of retard which is not politically correct anymore but he had that for a couple months because uh, he meant to drop it in a in a low drag and he dropped it in a high drag and ended up fallen into the ocean vice on the island he was supposed to be dropping it on that sucks yeah i always uh, try to make a case at home it doesn't work too well but when one of the four of us boys my wife and i have three kids you know someone will say the word retard at some point and i always make the case to my wife's like look that is an actual legit term <laughs> it slows something down as in a bomb and of course she just gives me that look because she knows darn well but yes there are retarded bombs yep and certain fins retard a bomb, but I think most people would agree with you. All right, so that's the Mark 80 series, and then correct me if I'm wrong, but we have this 
Blue series, BLU, Bomb Live Unit, I think it stands for. And roughly the same thing. We've got 500,000 and 2,000 pound versions. Same shape of the bomb. Uh, you can only really tell it kind of based on the striping. Uh, and I'd actually have to like look in a book before walking out to Jet to make sure I go. Uh, but they're kind of the newer ones. They have a new type of explosive fill in them. It's a little bit more stable. So those are the ones we prefer to carry on a ship because that way they're not going to cook off if there's a fire on the ship or something right. like that. We don't have to worry about all of a sudden a bunch of bombs just uh, to uh, to detonate. Of course, those are not in the nice, easy Mark 80 series order that would make sense because the uh, Blue 111 came out first, which is the 500-pound bomb. And then we go to uh, Blue 110, which is the 1,000-pound version, <laughs> and then Blue 109, which is the 2,000-pound version, which is actually a hardened target version. It's got kind of some special ridging on it mm -hmm. uh, that allows it to kind of stay together and get kind of through the ground a little bit more before it would what we call bomb breakup. And I think it's got a welded-in nose plug that doesn't allow for a nose fuse so that again it, yeah, it's going to make so, it through I mean, better yeah. based on what you know the type of fins and uh, fusing what we put into a bomb I mean there's literally a hundred different kind of combinations right. that we can build off of this kind of you, know, you can look at the the bomb, this Mark 82, as the spine, and then I can just start slapping a bunch of different things in there and kind of create a monster out of that in, in, in a lot of different ways. So as a quick side note to that, how do I tell the airplane what's on there? I've got a Mark 82 with Mark 15 snake eye fins, but all of a sudden the gunner comes up and says, hey, your target changed, and now you're going to carry this blue 109 with this other thing. I mean, this is a bad example, but the point is, the jet doesn't have eyes. It does have some connectors that allow it to ask what's on the weapon stations, but yep. for the most part, there's another way to do it. Yeah, so we have a stores management system uh, in the aircraft, and part of my pre-flight for uh, every time I go flying is it's a little kind of computer LCD screen on the, the side of the jet, and we kind of step through each station on the jet, and then there will be a two-digit code that will match that type of weapon. And then, of course, we have a cheat book that I would know ahead of time. So, like, a drop tank for us is uh, BD, which, you know, everyone remembers with the uh, the mnemonic uh, Big Daddy. So, you know, a, I think a off the top of my head, if I'm just going to go out and drop a Mark 82 dumb bomb free fall, it'd be, a, I think, a 21 code. And then that way the jet knows that, hey, I've got 500 pounds of something hanging and then I can also put a fuse code in there that right. will allow me kind of on my screen to select the different types of fusing. And then when we get into it, kind of our smarter weapons, JDAM is a perfect example. It's got a special umbilical that connects to the jet. So I just kind of tell the jet, I put an F0 code in that says, hey, this thing is a smart weapon. It will tell you what it is once we get uh, power on the jet. I always thought of that as, hey, figure it out yourself, jet. In other words, yeah, pretty go, much. go ask it what it is, and it'll tell yeah. you. So. so there's a lot more F-Zeros uh, hanging on the jets than uh, <laughs> these all these days. other codes. Right. Yeah. yeah, and your 21 example, also, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not just the warhead, but that's the warhead fin combination, because we can tell it what the fuses are, but we need to tell it what fins are on it, and that will be the 21. And then also, whether or not it's thermally protected, because I believe that will affect the ballistics. It will. So the computer needs to know, is it thermally protected or not? Is it these fins or not? Because then it gives those options you were talking about earlier in the cockpit for, hey, I may have high drag fins, but I have now the option to drop them high drag or low drag. Exactly. Cool. And so allow me the option in the jet. And then also now when I'm actually dropping it, because the jet is smart enough to kind of figure out the physics real time, uh, it will kind of change the symbology that I'm seeing in my HUD uh, as I go to try and drop that sure. weapon. Heads up display. All right, so these Mark 80s series and Blue 111 series, if you will, they are not just for the free fall general purpose bombs, but they're really the backbone of some of the other weapons we carry, right? Yep. So if uh, now if we want to get into, say, laser-guided weapons, uh, you know, which we've had around since the uh, kind of mid-60s, uh, but definitely started uh, reaching their peak during the first Gulf War in the early 90s. You know, now I take a Mark 82 bomb and I slap a uh, laser, you know, fin and a uh, nose cone on it, and they've got their own designations, but that creates a GBU-12 laser-guided weapon. So that bomb body is the exact same. Now I just have different fins. And again, now I put a, a different code into the uh, to the Jet 33, but now the Jet knows, hey, you're carrying a laser-guided version of a Mark 82. Okay. So it's got a laser seeker on the front. It's got some fins on the front and then the control fins on the back, I believe it is. Actually, the control's up on the front, right? And then the fins are on the back are just for stabilization. No, in, a, in a, our traditional laser-guided weapon, the fins uh, do move because they're what we call use bang-bang guided. Oh, 
That's right. So these things do full uh, deflection. So as they're tracking the laser energy, they make a full deflection and then correct back to that laser energy. And then as soon as it kind of means it's going to overshoot, so it corrects back the other way. Uh, which as the thing's falling, it's been said that you can hear this thing clacking as it's almost about hitting the target because they're going back and forth so quickly. And the bomb actually comes in on somewhat of a like a kind of a wobbly trajectory sure. as it gets in there. Kind of like a new driver trying to figure out a clutch. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. So where does the laser energy come from for something like this? So laser energy, uh, we prefer most of the time to provide it with our own aircraft. So on a uh, F-18, we have a uh, AT FLIR, so... Uh, advanced targeting forward-looking infrared pod that we slap onto the side of it. Uh, there's different versions that uh, other aircraft carry. I mean, so in that, I can see a target using infrared and then uh, kind of basically put the dot on the dot, and then uh, the jet will either put laser energy out for me or I have the ability to kind of put laser energy when I want uh, out there, and then that will be d- set to a specific code that the bomb has been set to as well, kind of matching those up so it knows to go specifically for that laser energy, and then it can follow that all the way down. But the uh, guys on the ground can provide us laser energy, so the uh, guy who had joint terminal attack controller uh, usually has some sort of uh, big machine with them that can provide laser energy. Those are getting smaller, though, as uh, those guys are trying to get more tactical. Uh, and then, you know, really the new rage is the, uh, you know, MQ-9, these uh, unmanned systems that are hanging out over at a target for a while. They have some sort of targeting pod on them as well that can provide laser energy. So, um, you know, it can be provided from my wingman. I can provide it. An unmanned aerial system, a guy on the ground uh, can do it. Most of the time we like to do it uh, ourselves because that way we make sure we know where that laser energy is uh, going. And we have different codes so that if two targets are being attacked in close proximity, my bomb knows to look for my target and your bomb knows to look for your yeah. target and it's going to ignore the Yeah, other. we could go even actually for the exact same target at the exact same time. Oh. Uh, and then that way, you know, my, for some reason, you know, my laser or my FLIR quits halfway through the delivery. We don't lose both bombs. You know, your bomb still goes to the target. And most of the time, if, especially if it's a kind of a sensitive target or a target that we're, we know we this is like our one chance to hit it. You know, we prefer to kind of double up the amount of weapons to increase our, our chances of sure. success. Now, can we change the laser that we're sending out of the aircraft? Yeah, we can. We have that ability in the F-18 on our AT FLIR page mm-hmm. that comes up in the cockpit that we have a button that we push that and put our laser energy. So I know what I can put in a uh, in an LGB that we actually have little dials on the side of the bomb that we have to dial. So once I've gotten into the jet, I can't do it. Uh, some of our other laser-guided weapons, though, we actually can change the, uh, the laser code inside the uh, aircraft. Um, so maybe someone else is set to a certain laser code. We can uh, deconflict from those guys. Okay. But if I'm flying with you and my FLIR goes down and we have a permissive environment, you could drop your weapon with your code, which you can't change on the bomb, but you can make it sure it's on the AT FLIR correctly, and then we could circle back around. You could change it and support mine. I just have to fly to the right piece of sky and push the button, and then you own it from there. Exactly. Cool. All right. Anything else on LGBs? Uh, no, I don't think that's, I think that's everything. I guess it might also be worth mentioning that there is a bigger version of an LGB called the GBU-24, which can do some of that penetration. Yeah, so that's that Blue 109 uh, warhead that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, a traditional kind of Mark 84 could probably go through maybe a foot of concrete. Blue 109 can go up through kind of six feet of concrete. So that gives us a little bit more penetration capability if there's a bunker or something like that. I mean, so we call that a GBU-24. Uh, there's a couple different versions of it, but for most part, it's a laser-guided uh, weapon that will just give us kind of better uh, guidance through a, through a bunker. But somewhat specialized, too, I would argue. At least when I was in, there was always a couple crews in every squadron that were pretty good with it. Everybody knew how to drop general-purpose bombs and LGBs and the next weapon we'll talk about, but the GBU-24 was a little more specialized. It's a, it's a little bit more finicky with the laser energy you have mm-hmm. to provide it because it's not one of those ones that you can just kind of give it laser energy at the last minute. You kind of need to give it uh, a lot more laser energy as well. And the fusing on that bomb is fixed. So instead of changing what that fusing time is, so I can kind of change how much it penetrates, I have a fixed fusing. So I kind of have to change the parameters I drop it to make sure that it either has enough energy to get through the bunker 
or vice versa, it doesn't have too much energy that it just blows through the other end. Right. And it's not blowing up in the space that I want to, to right. blow it up into. So instead of you telling the fuse what you want, we have a fuse that's telling us what it can give, and we've got to make sure the weapon hits with the right end speed and what well, yep. we don't call it so speed. We, but yeah, so we got to we got to calculate kind of really a basket, right? Um, that Impact we can angle that, that yeah. we can drop this bomb in to make sure that it does what we want it to do. Cool. All right, and then our last bread and butter free fall weapon is a JDAM. Talk to us about the joint direct attack munition. Yeah, so you know LGBs, we use those uh, quite a bit during the uh, the first Gulf War, but we had kind of some problems with some clouding, uh, preventing us from putting laser energy on that said target. Um, so we can't drop an LGB on it, and they want some sort of precise weapon. Um, so that created the uh, the need for hey, let's do something that we don't need to provide. Uh, laser energy with um, so that created the uh, the jdam which is uses the gps or the global positioning system that we have so again i get i take a mark 82 bomb body and now i s slap a different type of uh, tail kit onto this and now it becomes a gbu 38 uh, which is a 500 pound version of a, a jdam uh, so again kind of a confusing uh, naming convention because i have the gbu 38 as the 500 pound version GBU 31 is the 2,000 pound version, and the GBU 32 is the 1,000 pound version for all the uh, listeners keeping up there. Yeah. Alphabet soup. I might have to have a summary of this uh, in the notes. All right. So, and you brought up a good point I didn't think about earlier during our LGB discussion. I mean, that's, I won't say a permissive environment, but you need to be able to see the target to attack it with an LGB. Yeah, in if fact, a, if you lose the target, the bomb's going to go dumb, right? Yeah, and that's kind of one of the problems with an LGB because of that bang, bang guidance I talked about. Right. If, if I lose laser energy, it just made a full correction, and now it's when it misses, it's going to miss by a lot, which is one of the concerns we have. So also, if I have a kind of a target where I have concerns for collateral damage, i.e., you know, there's a baby milk factory right next to the building I want to drop on, if this bomb is going to miss. I don't want it to miss so much that it goes into the, the baby milk factory. You know, I want it to miss somewhere else close to, to the, uh, to the weapon. And that, right. that is so, and if I have a low undercast layer, you know, that I can't see through the clouds and even really, you know, a couple clouds just coming over the target at the inopportune time can really cause uh, a problem. Okay. So I drop an LGB and I've got to keep flying along roughly in that direction to support it. But with a JDAM, because it's GPS guided, it's almost like a fire and forget. I mean, it's not it, quite the it terminology. It is. You know, as soon as I, you know, hit that button uh, and drop it, it's coming off the target and I, I can head home if, you know, if I don't really need to see where it hits. But most of the time, the guys that uh, we work for want to see that to kind of confirm what the, da the damage is. So, you know, most of the time in the, the training environment, especially at in Fallon where I was working, you know, we'd push guys to drop laser guided weapons because it's more challenging because they have to stay in the target area. So it's like if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a uh, dodge a ball. <laughs> so, you know, if you can drop a LGB, you can easily drop a, a JDAM. Right, because there's more preparation, I would argue, to get a JDAM off. But once you push the button, you're done. Yeah, and, and the LGB is a system of systems, right? right. So the, everything on the LGB has to work as well as my AT FLIR and my laser. And if one of those things falls out, I can't drop it. Whereas, hey, the JDAM, as long as every, all its components on it is working mm -hmm. and the jet's good to go, I shouldn't have a problem dropping right. that thing. And we still consider that a free fall, even though it can sort of get to a target with a little bit. It's got those strikes that we mount on the side, right? Yeah, so, it so can... it's it's still a, a precise weapon. Really, an LGB and a JDAM are pretty close. I mean, we're talking uh, a couple feet difference on what their you know predicted accuracy is. No, but yeah, but I meant the distance I can f release this from the target also. Oh, JDAM, it's, I'd say it's, it's probably got a little bit because it's not as draggy. If you ever really see a JDAM and an LGB sitting right next to each other, you know, JDAM is actually pretty large. Those fins, when they pop out on an LGB, are pretty long, create a lot of drag, mm -hmm. as well as that guidance, you know, where it's Eats shaking back and forth. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have a lot of energy, whereas the JDAM is flying kind of a nice, smooth profile. So, you know, we can get a little bit more range out of it. Cool. All right, let's move on to glide weapons, though. And... You know, it's been a little while since I've been in the uh, business, but the only one I can think of here is the AGM-154 JSAO, Joint Standoff Weapon. Yep, that's our kind of bread and butter for glide weapons. So just kind of when we were creating the JDAM, uh, the JSAO was the one that came off uh, as well. We've got uh, two versions of that. We have the uh, JSAO A, uh, which has a bunch of little bomblets in it. So going back to our discussion on uh, that cluster munitions, it's kind of going away. And then our other one is the JSAL C, uh, which is kind of a hardened target. So it's got a, a brooch uh, warhead, which is uh, 
a smaller warhead that's going to kind of punch a hole through a hardened target, and then that kind of creates a path for the uh, the bomb to go through to actually destroy the target. So kind of a, some pretty wicked videos if you find any of those on uh, YouTube. Uh, that's pretty cool to see in, in slow motion as well. But now, because this thing has kind of wings that pops out, we can drop this hat at extended range uh, away from the target, and it's going to use the uh, GPS to guide itself to the target. Excellent. And we can program it to fly a particular path, too, I believe. We can. And, uh, you know, the big part when you're weaponeering that to make sure that you can drop it is really you got to make sure that, uh, again, using Fallon as an example, where we have a lot of mountains between probably where we're going to drop it and where we have the target, got to make sure that this thing is flying at a proper profile so it doesn't fly into the side of a mountain, but, you know, flies over that mountain and uh, hits the, uh, the target. But just like anything, you know, if I'm driving uh, to more points or taking more turns, it's going to kind of reduce the distance I can drop this sure. thing at. Because it's a glide weapon. So it's, it's a glide weapon. Like- it's got no no motor. So it is just using pure potential energy that is turning into uh, kinetic energy when it's coming off the jet. But we know that in the cockpit because we'll have rings that tell us, okay, if you drop it now, you, it'll get there. And if you drop it early, then yeah. kinematically it's not going to. We call them uh, launch acceptability ranges that will show up kind of on our display. So depending on my airspeed and my altitude, I'm changing the potential energy for that uh, weapon, again, to get into the physics nerdery uh, as well. So if I'm higher and faster, uh, I'm putting more energy on that thing so it can come off. So my ring is going to kind of grow in my aircraft to tell me that I can drop it farther. Uh, does it know about the winds too? Does it have like a It kind algorithm? of uses, uh, it, it assumes that, hey, it takes the winds that are up at altitude and kind of assumes a graceful degradation uh, as well. So that's something we look at prior to when we're planning this, like, hey, do we think there's going to be a big wind shear or something else that could affect this? Uh, so we can take those into account. Okay, cool. Now, we used to have some pretty interesting glide weapons in the past. I think they're all gone by now. The uh, walleye that used to have a TV in the front of it, and it would beam it back to you. And I guess in the, like with some of the early Desert Storm footage, that was... So I think everyone who's watched war footage, you see the the building from the pilot's perspective, and then the bomb comes in from the side and blows it up. But some of the older stuff, I, is it gone now, the walleye? It, yeah. yeah. The, okay. Not since I've been in. But, okay. but fun enough, though, the walleye, uh, we took that seeker and we put it on another weapon that we have, which is called the Slammy R. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, standoff yeah. land attack missile extended range, which is like a Frankenstein weapon because it's really just built from a different parts, but it uses the uh, the seeker from cool. the, uh, the walleye. But that was the one where you would actually see the target get bigger and bigger as if the viewer was yep. on the weapon. Just like, yeah, just like you would, in a, <laughs> and you do that in a Slammy R. Cool. Well, on that note, let's go ahead and move to the forward firing, and we, we can start with that one if you want. You said it was the standoff land attack missile extended range. So yep, so that's the... Uh, AGM 84 kilo, um, which was a, uses the body of a kind of a harpoon, took the uh, seeker of that walleye, and they kind of slapped it together. Uh, and that's something that we can now shoot at extended ranges. Really, it's uh, kind of our primary weapon. Um, if we want to know what we call real-time bomb hit assessment. So uh, I've got to take out a target, and maybe me kind of continuing on to the rest of the target area is contingent on me taking out this other target. I need to know real time if I hit that thing or not, not wait till I get back to the carrier and pull out my tapes and do all that stuff. So we can uh, control that weapon. It actually does have a motor on it, so it is powers itself as it's flying to a target. Um, and then we have a guy that can control it. So you can either control it by yourself using uh, an AWW-13 pod that would hang on, um, or someone else, your buddy, can control it for you uh, and fly it to the target. So the missile itself has a seeker in the front and a transmitter on the back, and it can beam it back to whoever's carrying that pod, and then they can, using the aircraft magic, have it displayed in the cockpit, and they can real time, no kidding, be flying that thing into the target. Yeah, you firm. Pretty cool. All right, and like you said, you could theoretically have a situation where whoever's in charge of that, the whole strike package, the whole team here is waiting at the gates to go, and if he knows he hit it, he might call touchdown or something, and if he misses, he might yell fumble, and everybody knows how to handle it. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. All right. What else do we have for forward firing? Probably the other footage guy I saw from uh, Dead Storm was the uh, Maverick. So there used to be a TV version that would use a TV to guide to the target. And that was used, I think, on the, uh, I forgot what they called the Road of Death there, kind of in Kuwait. Oh, out of Fallujah, was it? Yeah. uh, No, No, it was in Kuwait, but where we kind of just wrecked the army that was heading back up to 
Um, those guys use it because it the, the weapon is designed to be an anti tank uh, weapon. But uh, the w- version we have, the AGM sixty five E, is a laser maverick. So again, it's going to use that same type of laser energy either from myself, from my wingman, from a guy on the ground, or something like that. And it's just going to go straight to that laser energy. It's a great weapon because it's powered, and so it's really good against a moving target because it not going to lose energy because it's powering itself as it gets there. And it also actually has a pretty powerful warhead, but it's also pretty contained. Focused. Uh, Yeah, so that Mm -hmm. collateral damage I'm not as worried about uh, as well. But, again, designed to go against a – to to destroy tanks. Um, So that was really be its bread and butter. So it's like a rocket-powered LGB, essentially. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And as long as we can track the target with our FLIR – then whether it's a boat at relatively high speed or a tank or an armored vehicle, in fact, we can even track it and reduce some of the workload. And as long as the laser is firing, this thing is going to home in on it. Yeah, that's cool. what makes it a great weapon. Okay, excellent. All right, how about the AGM-88 Harm? Yeah, high-speed anti-radiation missile. So this one, again, is kind of a version of it's been around since Vietnam, and its main job is to go against the uh, radars that a surface-to-air missile uses. And this is what we call kind of a soft-kill weapon. Um, it's, a, it's a big missile. It weighs almost 1,000 pounds. But it's designed to hit you know, the actual radar dish that's uh, emitting uh, some sort of radar energy. And it, that, it just tracks that like a hound dog going to a scent uh, and then pops through that radar and destroys it and prevents the ability for the enemy to use the, their radar energy against us. Uh, as well. We do have a newer version of it uh, that is the E, uh, which is the Argum, uh, which is the uh, advanced, uh, I always get this wrong, advanced anti-radiation guided missile. Um, this one has an additional seeker in it now that also allows it, even if the thing's not emanating anymore, because that used to be a, a big tactic uh, from our enemies, um, then this can still probably hopefully find the, uh, the, the radar. So uh, really effective weapon. I mean, so effective during the Gulf War and the kind of later during Bosnia. The, the code name when we launch this, we say Magnum on the radio to let people know we're launching it. Uh, and it got to the point where, you know, a guy could just say Magnum on the radio without actually shooting a missile. And all the uh, surface to air operators, uh, around, you know, enemy surface to air operators would just turn their radars off because they knew they were about to get schwacked by a missile. So. <laughs> Tells you what a great weapon it was that we can just, even just saying the word became a fear itself for those guys. And we can program the missile to look for different seekers. So there could be different emitters out there. It's not just going to home on anything willy-nilly. It's going to say, well, the pilot wants me to look for this. And if I see it, great. And if I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, we can program it to do something as like a fallback. Yeah, exactly. So it can look for a couple different, uh, you know, signals at the same same time. Uh, in roughly well. the same location. Yeah, so we usually okay. kind of know what particular surface air system we want to go after okay. uh, when we launch it. A relatively important weapon, but on the other hand, I mean, we'll, we'll throw a lot of these into a heavily defended area because it can really do its job. Yeah, and it, it could provide us kind of some, what you know, harm coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it doesn't have to destroy the target, really, as long as the, the radar on a surface air missile is off. I'm winning, right? Because now I can get into a target area without this thing finding me. So, again, if I just say Magnum and they shut off without me actually destroying their radar, I can still get to the target area, still drop my bomb, still accomplish the mission, uh, and it's a a win-win. Sure. Okay. Now, you mentioned the harpoon before. We still even employ that thing? We do. That's kind of our main... uh, weapon that we're going to use against any sort of uh, ship. It's a powered weapon that we can drop from an F-18. Uh, it goes kind of a low altitude, and it uses its own sensor on it to detect the ship. The The Super Hornet's only been able to, able to carry it for, I think, maybe since about 2010, you know, so it's actually kind of a relatively, in the big scheme of things, kind of newer weapon uh, for us to carry, but it's a weapon that's been around forever. Yeah, the F-18 Hornet has had it for a long time. Yeah. So this is as close to a cruise missile as we get launching it. But unlike the harm, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's a ship that we're going after and there's another ship next to it, we don't have quite as good a discrimination with a harm. No, it all. is a active seeker that just detects some sort of metal, and it's so it's kind of one of those things we have to make sure that we don't have some sort of uh, – you know, cruise ship or something that's going in between us and the target we want to hit because if, as soon as it sees that metal, it's going to go after it. So you point well. the mad dog in the direction you want him to go. You take him off the chain, and, and he's he not may stopping. Yeah, he's going to attack somebody, but it, it might not be the person you want him to. Okay, 
outstanding. And then we talked a little bit at the very beginning about rockets. So rockets were important for a while. Then they got a bad rap with a couple of big fires on different ships. And yeah, you know, the now forest, they're kind of back though, right? Yeah, well, the four, you know, so the forest all fire, I think is one everyone probably seen the videos of. The little kind of interesting fact about that is the plane that got hit by an errant rocket that started the fire John McCain was actually sitting in that plane when it blew up. You know, he got out. Forrestal was uh, struck, and so he transferred over uh, to another carrier, and it was, I think, a couple weeks later that he got shot down and became a prisoner of war. So <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, run a bad luck uh, as well. And so because of that, uh, it was like, hey, you know, these things are a little too finicky. We can just kind of cook off. They're not as stable. We don't have that kind of newer explosive fill that we talked about like in the blue series bomb so they really just not have been allowed uh, on an aircraft carrier for a long time so the only time i've ever shot them was you know flying legacy f-18s in fallon because the other thing we have the problem now with a super hornet is even if they allow them on the ship super hornets got candid pylons but these things they're unguided so you know, if I'm a couple degrees off, these things are kind of going to my left and right rather than kind of straight down the the middle where I want them to go. Right. But we do have a uh, newer version of it, the uh, APKWS Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System. Uh, our Hilo brethren are actually carrying those right now, but they are laser guided uh, five inch rockets. Cool. So I can now, again, just like anything else, put a laser energy out there and these things uh, can go hunt down that laser energy. So a really good precision weapon that could go against a moving target or something else. So right. I want something that's low collateral damage, but it has a little bit of a uh, punch to it, a little bit more to the, than the gun, which we'll talk about here in a little bit uh, did, as well. I, did you say, have you had a chance to fire these? Uh, I have not. Let's say that only okay. the Helo guys are carried. Uh, no, I don't clear. mean the APKWS. I mean oh, rockets the old in rockets. General? Yeah, my have my you? first time around and found when I was qualified in the F eighteen. I got to shoot rockets Very a couple cool. times. You definitely felt like an old school kind of like Vietnam pilot, just yeah. you know here. Because funnily enough, I think the pod that was I was carrying the rockets in was probably from Vietnam because it was they're pretty old. Because <laughs> uh, we don't shoot these a whole lot. Yeah. The Marines, I think, use them a little bit uh, more often than we do. Yeah, uh, and like you said, helicopters can fire them. Yep. So I used to lecture on fins and fuses when I was at the weapons school. I remember that lecture. Uh, oh, cool. Thanks. Um, and when I got to Fallon as the operations officer, I had the opportunity to conveniently schedule myself for a flight shooting rockets, my first time ever. And I'll tell you a quick story. So we get in there, and we're going after an inert target. So these are live forward-firing rockets, but their warhead is inert. So it just hits and creates a dust ball or something. Well, so we, we roll in. I'm all excited. It's the first time doing this in 3,000 hours flying the stupid Hornet, you know. And pickle a couple of, of these off, pull off target. And I'll never forget this. The, the JTAC comes up. He goes, hey, you know, whatever my call sign was, confirm those are inert rockets. And, like, you know, the heart stops. I'm like, uh. And I think in that moment I, I managed something like, that's what I was told. <laughs> he goes, okay. Uh, so, like an idiot, you know, I – go back out to where they tell me to, and he thinks nothing more of it, and they bring me back again, and sure enough, we do it again, and we land, and there's all this hoopla. Well, turns out they had loaded live warhead rockets into my pod, which, you know, bad on me for not knowing what's in there, but on the other hand, the pod we're carrying shields the weapon. You can't tell yeah, what's in it. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. hard weapon to pre I mean, it's, it's not only the storage container, it's the guidance for the first couple feet of, of launching, and you can't really tell, but of course, I'm the pilot in control. And so my one and only experience was unfortunately jaded by that. And there was a big investigation. I think some poor ordnance guy got fired because he labeled it wrong oh, after he yeah. built it. And then, of course, they had to go out and clear the target because it was an inert target. But now suddenly live rockets went off. So that was awesome. Yeah. Well, not the uh, not the first time nor the last time that's going to happen. Yeah, in, probably. In range. So. All right. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Well, we have one more Ford firing weapon on the aircraft. What is that? So that would be our gun. Uh, so that's a 20 millimeter. So, you know, our F-18, our gun was really actually designed to shoot down planes. So, you know, it's only 20 millimeter, not like the uh, 30 millimeter, you know, for the A-10, which everyone raves about. And it also has a two degree cant up uh, to make it easier for me to shoot at another plane. Uh, as I'm fighting him. So that kind of changes a little bit of the dynamic as I, I shoot. But overall, it's still, you know, carry 400 plus rounds of those, and it can still do some good damage. Great against soft targets, against a moving target, and really low collateral damage uh, problems with that. So if I have to 
protect a guy on the ground who's uh, got the enemy pretty close to him, you know, our first option is going to be gun because we can actually get pretty accurate with that weapon as well as, you know, ha- don't have to worry about any sort of frag or anything hitting our, our, our good guys on the ground. Right. Um, so something we practice with uh, all the time. And uh, as I've gotten kind of later in my career, we've improved what we call our Z diagram or the parameters that we shoot the gun. And it's a pretty comfortable weapon to shoot and shoot precisely now. Cool. Yeah, that's always a lot of fun to uh, fire that thing. How fast is the firing rate? Uh, we can go 6,000 rounds per minute. So, you know, we're only carrying 400 rounds, not the 1,000 plus that a, a A-10 is going. So uh, really crazy to actually shoot that thing at night uh, when we do a gun shoot at night because uh, now you look like you're going into – uh, hyperspace because it just blanks out your HUD and your forward canopy screen and all that because all you can see is kind of the sparks as the the rounds are coming out. So uh, you kind of squeeze the trigger and count mentally in your head and be like, ah, I think it's probably time to pull away from the ground right now because usually we're shooting that down, botting them out around you know a thousand feet above the ground, which at night wow. at night can get uh, a little hairy if uh, if you're not ready for it, so especially in mountainous terrain. Yeah, so that's <laughs> uh, that's something we talked about our new guy. So the first time a new guy is going out to shoot a gun at night, you kind of really got sim down and be like hey it's gonna really create some confusion there in that right. second you pull so pull come off the trigger and then start pulling away from the ground and then uh, get back on and your, get your wits on, back. your instruments yeah i never had a chance to do that i'm kind of bummed never shoot at night never shot at night yeah. yeah when i was at the weapons school they were starting to really get back into it for various reasons overseas and then some crews got to do it and i just never did and i mean our our currency and our requirements to right. for guys to be able to do that it's actually pretty robust because it's probably the closest uh you know my little c story is uh one of the things i did at fallon is i was a jtac instructor so i'd go out to the range and teach the uh guys how to to call in uh attacks on targets and all that stuff and Probably the closest I've ever seen to a, a jet crashing was one night. A guy lost his wits about him and pulled out. I mean, so low that I saw the afterburner kind of reflecting off the ground as oh, we're just geez. screaming, pull up to this guy, right. you know, and uh, probably happened uh, every couple months out in Fallon. <laughs> so it's it's something that, we you know, you got to practice at the day quite a bit, make right. sure uh, you're very comfortable in that pattern before you go out and do it at night. Before you turn the lights out. Are you wearing night vision goggles when you're doing you're something doing, like that? Yeah, so that uh, also gains down your NVG, right. so they're no longer effective uh, either. Wow. Excellent. All right, well, we don't always go out and shoot. Well, we get to shoot the gun some, but we don't always go out and drop all these other bombs we talked about. But this is a perishable skill, especially the general purpose weapons where we need to get ourselves in a particular part of the sky and then push the button at the right time, or we can hold the button and the system will allow it to come off at the right time. But talk to us about some of the practice weapons we can use so that we can save money and clean up on the range by not using the real stuff. Yeah, you know, especially with a live weapon, you know, that kind of really reduces the amount of targets uh, we can drop. Because if I'm dropping a, a bomb that blows up every time, you know, that just destroys the target and uh, kind of reduces the effectiveness of our training as well. So, you know, inert weapons are actually really our go to weapon because they hit the ground. They still give us the same kind of instant feedback of, hey, that bomb hit where you want it to hit, but it doesn't do a whole lot of damage other than kind of punching a hole through a, a box or something like that. So, our main one that we use to simulate all our kind of mark. 80 series weapons uh, is the Mark 76, also commonly referred to or lovingly referred to as the Blue Death um, (laughs) because it's a 25-pound bomb painted blue because all our inert weapons are painted blue so we can instantly identify them. Unfortunately, not rockets apparently. But uh, 25 pounds, and we put that thing on a, on a rack. So usually we carry about six of those on a pylon, uh, and they it's kind of designed to mimic the ballistics, i.e., you know, the physics of falling off the aircraft, the exact same as like a Mark 82. So I can go out there, roll in on a target, and then assess my airspeed, altitude, what my system is telling me, uh, and then now I'm just dropping a 25-pound piece of metal vice a 500-pound piece of metal and get all the exact same training that I was working on. It still boggles my mind, though, that a 25-pound bomb can replicate the ballistics of a 500-pound bomb. I I can't get my head around that, but well, some some smart guy figured it out years and years <laughs> ago, and uh, who yeah. knows how between the two of us, we probably dropped you know thousands oh, gosh, of those yes. things right like yeah. I mean, we go through those uh, 
pretty quickly. And it basically looks like, again, this might be a crazy analogy, but for anyone who's got kids with, the, it's like a small football that's got the little tail yeah, on that it. Yeah, ner- that, that Nerf thing yeah, that like you're supposed ball. to be able to yeah. check. Yeah, it looks exactly like that. It looks like, like that. that, but blue. And, and 25 and pounds. to your point, they'll put a little smoke charge in there so that you can get a little puff of white yep. that helps feedback as well. It's like a shotgun well. shell that's yeah. in, in the front of it. So Because a couple guys, what happens is they, uh, they, they find one of those and they take it back to the room and they get in trouble with the... Uh, <laughs> With the Ortiz because they're still like a you know shotgun shell in there, right. uh, which is a, a, has been a, been an issue before. Oh, I'm sure. Now a Mark 76 though isn't going to help us train on carrying or employing, I should say, a laser guided bomb. So what do we have for that? So that we have a uh, LGTR laser guided training round, uh, which kind of looks looks like a big long skinny tube, um, and it probably weighs about 75 pounds, but does kind of all the same thing as a Mark 76 gives me all the same symbology. And actually does track uh, laser energy, so that's why I can go out there, put laser energy on a target, and then that thing will guide to the target. And again, give me feedback of, hey, my system's working or not uh, working. Um, And it simulates, uh, and it used to be we'd actually put a code in for a GBU-12 in the jet. So the jet would think that you would have six GBU-12s on your jet, so you're 3,000 pounds heavier than you actually thought you were. Um, but now we have kind of with our updated software in the jets, we actually have a, a special code that says, hey, this is an LGTR, not a GBU-12. Because, again, that's uh, gotten some guys in trouble going off a uh, asking for a 3,000-pound heavier cat shot than they were supposed to because they forgot to uh, do the math there. All right. Well, so we had a workaround, in other words, when the LGTR came out, and now we've been able to catch up with technology. That's good. Yep. Is, is that thing any better? I remember when I was younger, it was, it was kind of a – it wasn't great. They 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 hit short of the target quite okay. a bit, you know. But it, it's one of those that even even a perfect bomb, you can go out and do everything perfectly. Put the laser energy right where you want to. The weather can be perfect, and you know, that's it. It's a system of systems, so right. something can fail. So you know, an LGTR failing on you is is really simulating what we m- might happen in real okay. life. We can't count on a bomb hit, getting to the target one hundred percent of the time because things fail. Sure. But when you were in Fallon and you were helping air wings coming through, getting ready for deployment, was it true that if you guys saw the student do everything he could, you'd still give him credit basically? Uh, we, we actually kind of went the other direction you, of like, we kind of held okay. a harder line. Like, Hey, I mean, we have to see a bomb hit the target because you know, we're, we're holding guys to a high standard. Like sure. we want them to go out into combat and combat be easier for them. Um, because we held them to a high okay. standard. So yeah, sometimes some guys would give us the, uh, it's an LGTR and I'm like, Hey, well, you know, as I said, even a GBU 12, yeah. you could do everything perfect in the jet, but that GBU 12 didn't hit the target, did not meet your required piece of D that you were right. uh, your task yeah. with. And we're going to have to come back the next day and hit that target again. And that's what a lot of guys think or forget that we can do everything perfectly we could still not really accomplish the mission. Sure. The fuse could be a dud. Uh, the target could have moved. There's a hundred different things yep. that can happen. So now I thought I remember hearing that some sick SOB was going to take an LGTR and throw some explosives in it and turn it into like a super low collateral bomb. Did that ever happen? No, it didn't. Like that was the rumor. I think, uh, <laughs> kind of when, uh, the, the war in Iraq, you know, uh, OIF was really kind of getting hot and we we're, you know, after Fallujah we're certainly collateral damage or, you know, we're, hitting a lot of targets so i remember hearing that too because you can carry six of those on a rack on on one side of the jet so been a good little like kind of sniper weapon you know put five pounds of explosive and now you're lobbing grenades from a super hornet which probably some people decided that was not really an effective use for a, you know a multi-million dollar aircraft but uh the one of the blue weapons that we didn't talk about earlier uh that they did create after fallujah was the uh, the blue 126 and uh, it was a, kind of a easy thought, like, hey, well, why don't we just take a 500-pound bomb? Because we already know the ballistics. We know how to fit it on a jet. And why don't we just put a lot less uh, explosives in it, i.e., let's just put 50 pounds instead of 250 pounds. And now we've just reduced uh, the collateral damage. So that bomb has been actually pretty useful for us because, you know, it looks like a Mark 82. It flies like a Mark 82. I can pair it up with a, a GBU-12 kit or a JDAM kit, do all the same thing. And I don't have to worry as, about as much uh, blast or frag uh, if I'm worried about collateral damage. Do they just leave the rest of it void, or how do they do that with the reduced? Yeah, they ex- just fill the rest of it, uh, you know, just with more cement. So it still weighs 500 pounds. So again, it it flies all those same ballistics. Gotcha. All uh, right. But just minimize the uh, the, the explosive fill in it. So back to my awful Easter egg example, I guess it would be like if uh, a fifth of the filling were caramel and the other was 
chocolate or something. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And then you'd be mad once you got home and realize you kind of got gypped a little bit uh, <laughs> on that egg. But I think it's worth mentioning, though, that a lot of the conflicts we've been in for the last 20 years have been very collateral damage sensitive. In other words, like you said, if it's a baby milk factory or a mosque or something else, bigger is not always better. We don't want to level the neighborhood. We want to precisely hit what we're going after and not much else. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, you know, World War II, right, where we sent 30, Fire 40. Fire Dresden, right? Yeah, right, where we're sending tons of bombers because their accuracy was so poor that we're like, well, we just got to carpet this area to hit the target. Um, you know, we've moved to more precise and precise weapons. So, it's, sure. you know, that's our goal is always really like, let's minimize damage to what we can do. Like, let's hit what we need to hit and destroy it so we don't have to come back again and cause maybe more problems. But sure. if I don't have to destroy the building next to it, uh, that makes everyone's kind of life a little easier down the line. I mean, it's kind of a pessimistic look. You know, either way, I'm still dropping a bomb uh, in an area. But uh, cloud damage is always a huge concern every time we're weaponeering. It's probably right. one of the first things we really talk about when we're given a target. Be like, okay, what is my collateral damage uh, around this, you know? Well, that being said, though, alternatively, I will say there is still a place for carpet bombing. Believe it or not, the B-52 still maintain that as a mission. And I, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But anecdotally, I was told that when Desert Storm 1 kicked off several days into it, the, the enemy troops were just demoralized because it was yep. just this barrage. Yeah, and of- I mean, it, you know, if the Russians come through the fold of gap, right, which is what we trained for in the Cold War, uh, certainly I want to maximize my firepower and, and, you know, go back to just rolling in with GP weapons so I can just drop things really quickly and, uh, you know, maximize my uh, effects. But, I mean, all the targets I've ever trained to and, and dropped and, uh, it's you know, helping out in Afghanistan as well, it was it was always, you know, buildings or, you know, one or two people on the ground that were surrounded by other things that we didn't want to destroy. Sure. But to that point, that's why we still have those general purpose weapons because we still need that skill and capability. But for the most part, everything we do nowadays is pretty precise. You know, some people are quick to point out that the FA-18 can't carry as much as an A-6 did, but I would argue we're a heck of a lot more lethal. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was a a great picture of a a VFA-213 jet, um, you know, launching off the front of the aircraft carrier in, um, you know, last year with 10 GBU-32. So, you know, 10,000 pounds of precise, you know, that, that, would have done two or three probably of those, uh, you know, B-17 raids back in World War II, you right. know, just from that one aircraft. So uh, yeah. we, we do a pretty good amount of d- damage for, for what we can carry on the the aircraft. The Super Hornet's a pretty good bomb truck for sure. when it comes down to it. And we didn't even talk about it, but that aircraft that did that, when that pilot pushed the pickle button to release those, all 10 of those knew where they were going. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, now I have one kind of common area. I drop it, and they all go to their – uh, their designated target. Um, so Skynet, man, yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Uh, we've been at this for a while. Anything else we want to talk about? Uh, no. So I think the only other one maybe is the future. So we kind of hinted at it with the uh, AGM-158, the uh, JASM, Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, which got kind of some uh, a little bit play in the news here with that most recent strike on Syria with the uh, B-1s carrying it. Uh, only the Air Force is carrying it, but this is kind of our new uh, future glide slash uh, long range weapon that we can drop uh, at range. Uh, we should eventually be able to carry it on the Super Hornet, still going through all the testing and, and everything, but that will give us a much greater kind of standoff range to hit targets uh, okay. as we get there. But uh, I mean, really, other than that, you know, the weapons haven't changed a whole lot in you know my 16 years, and you know, probably weren't a whole lot different from kind of when you started as well. You know, that Mark 80 series is still our bread and butter right. uh, for what we we can drop. Yeah, for sure. Now, are you? I'm not F-35 literate at all. Are you? Are, does it carry all these same things? It will eventually. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, right. It's, I mean, it's, testing it's, wise, testing wise, they, money, they've got but, to. But uh, you know, I mean, again, they're kind of designed really. You know, okay. JDAMs what we kind of lean to a little bit right. more. So Because, I mean, I'm not prepared to talk about all the various Air Force weapons. I don't even know any of them. And no, I would, hopefully yeah, you don't either. But yeah. uh, like F-22 has got some small diameter bombs. and But again, it's just smaller, precise weapons that the different fighters out there have. So Yep. Cool. All right, man. Well, I think we covered all of it. I do appreciate you coming to the show and talking air-to-surface weapons. Uh, we've already kind of touched on it, but what's the future hold for you? Uh, so right now, like I said, I'm finishing up my uh, training track, and then uh, hopefully maybe this late summer I'll show up to be executive officer of VFA 154 and 
Um, we start workups next January, so start going up to Fallon, uh, back to my old haunting grounds oh, yeah. for some training and back out to the boat for deployment later that year. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I've got that boat amnesia. I forgot how long it's been since I've been on the carrier, so I'm actually looking forward to going back on it. Uh, That'll and, end in about 24 uh, yeah, hours. Give me, <laughs> give me one day, and I'll be like, what did I talk myself yeah. into? But, uh, yeah, I'm excited back to get getting back to an operational squadron, being in a ready room, and uh, continuing flying uh, for sure. F-18s. For sure, dude. Well, hey, on behalf of all the Fighter Pilot Podcast listeners, I want to thank you for your service. Thanks for coming on the show and talking about this. And good luck as an XO, because if everything goes well, that means then you'll be a CO, and that can open future doors, or you can do more than most people do and, and bow out at that point, and we'll, we'll keep in touch with yeah, you and see how it future goes. CA. It's good seeing you again, Jello. Thanks for uh, inviting me out. All right, well, don't leave yet, because we have one traditional final question here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and that is, I need to know how you got Farva, and I think we kind of already touched on it, but come on, give us something. Yeah, so I joined VFA 137 uh, when they were on deployment. I uh, actually flew out on uh, Thanksgiving Day in 2004, uh, and they'd been on deployment for about a month and a half, and uh, they, I think, pretty much were watching Super Troopers on uh, a nightly basis. They really wanted to call the new guy Farva, uh, and I happened to be a large, obnoxious guy that wouldn't keep my mouth <laughs> shut, so it kind of just worked out uh, right. So... Uh, like I said, probably one of those many Farvas from about that time frame. I had a laugh when you and Ferg were talking about Farva uh, because that is kind of my generational call sign. Oh, yeah. Uh, and actually, Super Trooper 2 uh, is coming out this Friday. So I was like, well, this is going to start a whole new rash of Farva call A whole new generation. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Dude, that story is almost precisely what Jack Curtis said uh, for his call sign. So, yeah, you two guys, do you know him? Uh, I, we, we chat back and forth. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, <laughs> it's pretty funny. You know, in my generation, it was Bluto or, you know, from Animal House. Well, that, that was a little earlier than me. But, you know, any any good comedy movie that comes out where someone buffoons themselves uh, yeah, Frank in, the in Tank. the movie. Frank the Tank's been the, yeah. know, the more later one oh, yeah, from sure. uh, old school. Sure. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we got to get uh, we got to get old Ferg back to talk some more call signs. Everybody loved episode two. So appreciate you mentioning that. All right, dude. Well, unless you got any parting shots, let's get out of here. That's all I got. All right. See ya. Our thanks again to U.S. Navy Commander Colin Price for that fascinating discussion on air-to-surface weapons. Hope you learned a lot. I did. And in fact, while I was listening to it one final time to get ready for production on this episode, I Googled and found a photograph of the F-18 Super Hornet he spoke of with the 10 JDAM. So we'll link to that in the notes, as well as some of the other terms and items we discussed today. We will update the glossary tab on our website to include anything new we talked about, so you can use that as your resource as well. All right, well, that will pretty much do it for this episode. I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. I want to take a moment to thank a few people who helped make this show possible. First, my sister, Julie Canta of Plum Creative, who offers graphic design help, as well as my stepdad, Jim, who does the intro and outro vocals, our photographer, Eric Larson, and Jaime Lopez of Rantam.com, who provides our intro and outro bumper music, custom just to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. All right, well, that will do it for this episode. You have a great July. We'll see you back here in about 10 days for the next episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it.